All right. So again, we're taping this mid afternoon Thursday, Carlisle to Indiana, which yeah, that, that was interesting. I thought he was going to Milwaukee and then Milwaukee ended up somehow winning the Brooklyn series. He probably was going to Milwaukee if that so then he, happened. Yeah. Then he audibles to Indiana and that's a, like a fun Rick Carlisle team. They have a lot of weird players like Brogdon and Sabonis, these kind of creative offensive players that I think are in his wheelhouse. I, I actually like the move. Well, good for Rick too, because, you know, Indiana needs somebody that wants to be there and plans to stick around for a bit. Do we agree on that? Yes. I mean, they, they blew it on Nate McMillan, in my opinion. And you can we can say everything we want about it, but Nate McMillan looks pretty darn good to me right now. Um, yeah. The one they really blew it was Nate Borton, obviously. But I, I think um, with Rick, I think his time there was really great. I think it's a place that, you know, he's already established there. And he's a very different coach this time than the first time he coached in Indiana. No question about that. That's stating the obvious. He's got gravitas. He's got a championship. He's learned how to adapt and grow and, and deal with players. And uh, and I, I I mean, I think he's one of the best coaches around. Always have. Ta you know, tactically, he's really, really good. Now, he's, you know, he can be a thorny personality. He knows that about mm. himself. He's very direct. Um but By the way, I've that's a thorny him, team. He's he'll fit in right. with, yeah, with some of the be. guys on that team. And and he's kind of what I call an autocorrect guy. So like he'll say something and then I'll realize, well, that was kind of snippy or whatever. And then he'll call you back and say, ah, well, I wanted to add to that. Or, you know, so he's got a conscience. He's a brilliant guy. We know that. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, not just about basketball, about everything. So I like it too. And I think it saves face for Indiana. I mean, it's pretty embarrassing to What's going on there, coaching wise? Do you think? Do you think Philly is happy they have Doc Rivers as their coach? Do you I, do you I, wish I, that I, they had had gone through one more year, Brett Brown, and then they would have had their pick of all these dudes? Like, I think on the one hand with Doc, I didn't never got see. I I mean, I'm biased. I'll just admit to you right now, I'm biased because I think Brett Brown is a really good basketball guy, and I think. You know, it's that classic case of a guy that was just there too long, right? You, you stop yeah. listening or whatever. And I think he was dealing with an impossible situation that now Doc Rivers understands quite acutely. That's what I think. And I think he did his best to manage Ben Simmons without embarrassing him, which, by the way, Doc, you know, his comments at the end were very interesting, too. He backtracked the next day. But, you know, the truth serum told us he wasn't sure about Ben going forward. And, how can and, how can anyone be sure? No, hundred percent, hundred percent. But I just always thought like Brett Brown took so much grief yeah. for his handling or quote unquote mishandling of of Ben Simmons, and I knew so much behind the scenes of how he was trying. You know, he at one point said to him, "Look, do you want me to just sit you down if you don't shoot? Do you want me to say if you don't shoot these, I'm going to bench you because I can do that." And I think that's what ownership wanted him to do, but that's not who Brett Brown is. Yeah. He's a much fairer person than that. He's, he's a more cerebral person than that. He's a better person than that. And so, and yet he paid for it with his job. So that's just my little aside. Well, Doc, I, defensively, I thought they did some really nice stuff against Trey and that series just came down to he didn't have the balls to bench Ben Simmons in the last nine minutes or maybe not the balls or maybe he just didn't. You you know, once you do that, that player is leaving after the season. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, do I, I want to do, do this? Do I want to right. do can I win this series with him or am I going to make this leap where there's no coming back once I do this? But he well, should have. And, and if you win the series, you then have to go to the next series and are you not going to play Ben Simmons? Or, right, with Ben know? Simmons I mean, is, in his own head. I didn't really have, I didn't really think Doc Rivers had much to do at all with what happened with the Sixers, to be honest, in this. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not really. I didn't, I didn't see it that way. The one game I think was the, what was it, the fifth game when they were up 22-23 yeah, there that's was some on everybody. stuff you could feel and it just kind of happened. It was like watching a slow motion car crash for a half hour. And I don't even know who to blame in those scenarios. Did you uh, see the, 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 the enduring image of that game was Doc with bent over with his hands on his knees. Right. Remember that? I'm like, I, I, I turned to Mike, my husband, I said, oh man, they're going to be running that on Sports Center all day tomorrow. And they did. And I'm sure Doc was just like, you, you got to be kidding me. And that's I, that kind of brings me back to the Hawks for just a second. They are never out of games. I know. They What's just the, never It's the are. era now. It's 2021. Yeah. You can't, just, if you're down 20, you still have a chance. Yeah, but they do it. Like, I think um, games they've been down 20 plus points. I think they've come back to win 11 times since Nate McMillan became their coach. That's right. a big number. 
That is a big number. Same thing for that Clippers Utah game, which I was lucky enough to go to. It was 75 yeah. 50 at halftime, but it's like, oh, not. Yep. They'll make nope, one nope. run. They, do, they, they have too right. many three point shooters. Yeah. Exactly. That was the same kind of thing. And it's interesting when you're in the building for those where yeah. the slow motion car crash games, and I'm watching Quinn Snyder. I actually thought he did all the right things except for not taking Gobert out. He's calling timeouts. He could feel the momentum shifting ways, basically yeah. using every sort of thing he could do, but they couldn't change the fundamental reality of that game. It's like, you can't play Gobert if you have five guys out there and they're all hitting threes, which is what happened. What happened Clippers yeah. going to this next series and, you know, the Suns are better defensively and suddenly those threes aren't as wide open, stuff like that. But I just, you could see it it happened so fast and you could see the coach and Quinn Snyder was kind of frantic on the sidelines because he could feel it. But right. what are you going to do? You what are know, you going to do? Can't put a jersey I'll tell you, on. They, I really feel like for him, ha losing Mike Conley early in that series and yeah. then, you know, a shell of Mike Conley came back for the the last game. It, it killed him because he runs their pick and roll for him. He gets the ball zipping. That's when they were good. You know, the Utah Jazz were the best team in the NBA during the season because they never stopped moving the ball because they were they were getting, you know, running out in transition and hitting pull up three pointers. Hmm. Like I, I couldn't believe it early. I'm like, how many pull up three pointers are these guys going to take a lot? Cause they made them and that's what made them good. And so when Conley went out so much of that and you know, Donovan wasn't hundred percent. I mean, when we look back on these playoffs, we're just going to be talking about all the people we're missing, which is a shame, right? We're going to talk about all we're the injuries and all the people that weren't playing. And that's, that's too bad. Yeah, it's, we did the math on Sunday's pod. It was out of the top 11 guys in the league. Nine of them are out. Kawhi's hurt. And then Giannis was the last guy left. Now, you could argue Trey has now moved in. Now that is now a 12-person list because of how well he's played. But, but, but by the way, he's hurt. Don't forget, he's playing with a bad shoulder because he yeah, is. You right. Know? So. Um, the Celtics coach. Yeah. So we, there was a lot of... A lot of he buzz may. about this the last week. He had a relationship with Tatum and Brown from right. uh, the world championships from two years ago. And I think those guys vouch for them. Um, I think they clearly were hoping to hire a black coach. I think they understood the significance of that. I think it was significant to Tatum and Brown. I think it was important to those guys. 100%. And yeah. it was a, it was a pick that made sense for a lot of reasons, but he coached under Popovich, spent a little Brett Brown time, Steve Nash this year. Right. Um, what they do you loved know? him there. They love yeah, how, him there. What do you know about him? Have you interacted with him? What's what's your scouting um, report? I've I've interacted with him very little, but I w I was in Milwaukee like a week and a half ago, and uh, for a story that never ran because the Nets lost before we could run it. <laughs> but hmm. that's neither here nor there. But uh, you know, I was there, and I Ime was name was everywhere with the Celtics. You kind of had a feeling he was definitely one of the front runners. So I started asking around. I asked it around all the Nets coaches, and I saw a couple of the players and. You know, he's one of these guys, people rave about him. People were telling me he was a little bit of a James Harden whisperer. Like he really got James Harden mm. to, you know, get buy in. And he he's a no-nonsense guy. Like he players really like him because he's helpful. He's he's not a self-promoter at all. And you know, there's nothing players hate more than a self-promoter coach that's trying to use them, you know, looking for cameras and showing them how to do something to get their own career. He, none of that went on with him. I mean, he really uh, you know, he he was raised at the foot of Greg Popovich and espouses a lot of his beliefs. You know, you, you never see him quoted anywhere. Like, that's just not his style. And that's why I think he's so like-minded with Brad Stevens because Brad Stevens is not a self-promoter at all. And it's funny. There was this sort of weird backlash about Brad after his first couple of years because he was really killing it and he was great on the ATOs, you know. Uh, I'm sorry. OTIs. <laughs> Jeez, I said that completely wrong. <laughs> Out of timeouts. And... um. And there was like a little bit of backlash from the coaching fraternity that I didn't really understand. Really? Because, yeah, there was just a little bit of it. Like you heard it. Like people were a little jealous or something. They thought he got too much attention. And yet he never asked for any of it. Yeah. You know, he never brought any of it on himself. It was so, it was dickheads like me calling him President Stevens. Probably there you go. Not helping. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're to blame. I yeah. blame everything on you. Thank so that, you. That, yeah, there you go. So he. So anyway, my point is he never was into that. And I think to find a like-minded coach who's not into that either, I think it's, I think Brad's like, this guy cares about defense. I care about defense. There's a, you know, there's a little bit of an analytics background there, of course. Um, he's, he, he relates to players. He, you know, he respects players. He treats people with respect, something that's important to Brad Stevens. And yet he has an edge to him. And I know most people don't see that side of Brad Stevens, but I'm telling you, it's there. The players have seen it. 
The players know it's real. And I think this guy is going to be the same way. I think publicly what you're going to see won't tell the whole story because privately he's going to challenge people, um, but he's just not going to tell you about it. And he's not going to embarrass his players. I think there's, and I don't want to make too much of this. So aggregators be careful. Um, I think there was a, re a realization that there needed to be a subtle culture shift with that entire organization for a couple of reasons. One, two, just too white all over the place. Like they knew they had to fix that. Yeah. And then the second piece was, um, I don't want to say it's distrust, but Trader Danny traded a lot of people over the years and everyone was expendable at all times. And I think there was a feeling of like, does this team have my back? Right. You know, no, and, then, yep, and yep. right. And right as all of that's happening, then Danny has the comments during the uh, net series where he kind of, I don't know, they didn't seem like he took some of the race stuff in Boston seriously enough. And I think that had an impact I he was gone already. He was leaving, but right, in general, right. I think they just had to do some house cleaning and kind of reimagine how players saw playing for this team and, and what the organization itself cared about. Cause I do think they care about the right things, but I think they're very conscious of there's subtle things here that we need to fix. You yeah, agree with that? And I have, I do. And I haven't talked to Danny. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leaving him be. He's, he's out, you know, so I haven't asked him about that, but those comments that you're referring to where he said that he had talked to players and never had heard about any racial problems or issues um, with players on his team. Now, we can look at that one of two ways. He can genuinely, he could be genuinely telling us that's how he feels. And that's, mm -hmm. and so what that tells us is he wasn't as plugged in with his players as he probably should have been. Yep. Okay. Because I, I talked to Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown and plenty of those guys about some of the racial issues in Boston. And they exist everywhere. I'm not saying it's just Boston. Or he was just trying to prop up a franchise that means everything to him. Yeah. And trying, you know, and so I don't know which one it is because I, I haven't asked him, but you're right in your your comments about how it, re it kind of reverberated a little bit around the league. I mentioned to you I was in Milwaukee and I was staying at the Brooklyn Nets team hotel. Um, people were coming, going. I, I ran into some Bucks people, too. And not one, not two, but three different people asked me about that. Mm. And they said, wow, that was not good. And I, I, so I'm like, okay, cause this is reverberating outside our city, you know? Right. And, uh, and, and look, Boston has a complicated history. We don't have to go through this again. Um, the Celtics do not have a complicated racial history. That's the, really the irony of it. And we've said no, this a been, thousand times. They've been a know? leader over and over again. Right. Right. And so, but again, your players, there was just a lot of, what's the word? <sighs> Turmoil. I, I, turmoil is a too strong a word. But just, I would say unease. Unease is a good word. Yeah, and, that something something was slightly off, and oh, nobody all, really all knew year. how to describe it. But it yeah. dates back even to the Kyrie season in 2018. Well, it's, it's the last last three year's years. the bubble, and yeah. then this year it was off, and it's yeah, just kind think, of been something's off. I think the last three years have been really, really tough for the players and for the coaches, and I think it contributed probably to Brad stepping down, to be honest with you. I think it was a pretty grueling three years. People say Agree. last year, no, no, no. This goes back three years, all the way back to the, the season with Kyrie that was just catastrophic in so many ways. And uh, one of the reasons I believe that Al Horford did go to Philadelphia and take, well, the more money didn't hurt either. But I think he was like, uh, this is dysfunctional, you know? Yeah. So in that in that regard, and he may have some work to do, but I just think just by Hiring him is such a great start. This young person with no previous ties to Boston, I think I kind of felt like that was important too. Who's got in an incredible regards. background too. Like, it and he's a really yeah. tough guy. And I think yeah. this team did not have toughness. So I said it a oh, million times. It yeah, was the softest 100%. Celtic. It was the softest good Celtics team I've ever watched. And yep. I think they knew it. But um, I think he will bring a toughness back. Because ultimately, like you need the three guys, assuming Smart is staying. Right, you gotta, which I'm not gotta, sure he is. But, yeah, who you know. knows? But assuming yeah. he's staying, Brown, Tatum, Smart, need those guys to buy in and set some sort of toughness tone. Trey Young shouldn't be tougher than everybody in the Celtics. Like, let's start yeah, but, there. But Trey he's, Young he's, is tougher than everyone on the Celtics. He, he's tougher than like 90% of the league, True. man. Fair. I mean, you know, like he's 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 earned that. Yeah, that's legit. That And again, that's what I mean. There's tough and there's fake tough, right? Trey Young's not fake tough. Let me tell you right now. He's just not, you know? And and the Celtics do need some toughness. I think you, 
you've got to bring the right veterans in to maybe add a little bit of that. I mean, I loved Jay Crowder when Jay Crowder was in Boston. I Me too. Kind of t- I loved Marcus Morris. As frustrating as Morris senior. was, Morris was yeah. another one. Yeah, and Trey, you know, the Clippers miss him. The Clippers miss him desperately. He's not playing, you know, he's been hurt. He's not yeah. playing much in the second half. They miss him a ton, I think. Trey that had this toughness. moment last night. Giannis fouled him on a three. Hit him in the face after he right. shot it. And Giannis complained to the ref and Trey was w- walking by him and he just cur- turned around and kind of sneered at him like, you hit me in the face. Like, he was yeah. just mad. Like, he was like, ready to fight him. Yeah, no, I was I, like, absolutely. I love this guy. I could have stayed yeah. him three months ago. This is my favorite guy <laughs> in the league. I love that he's like trying to bully Giannis. Giannis is seven feet tall. I know, but that's just how is. he carries himself. And the whole Celtics team, they didn't have that all year. They, you could hit anybody in the team. Kyrie, they're racing to hug them after playoff games where they lose by 20. And it's like, what, what's yeah. happening? And I do feel right. like Brad lost the steering wheel a little bit. Because little the toughness has to come from either your best player or the coach or both. And that right. team wasn't tough. Well, and again, we talk about playing hard, right? So it seems like such a simple concept. Your team should play hard. But how many teams really do it all the time? Or even most of the time. And the Celtics did not. Yeah. They did not. They quit so, in so many games that that just can't happen. All right. Can't so happen. that's a team that's having a culture change. The other interesting team that's at a little crossroads is Dallas. Yeah. Carlisle leaves. They fired Donnie Nelson finally. Um, there's some huge power struggle. Haral Bob, who's been on this podcast a bunch of times. Um, Has he? Yeah. He's... Um, had Cuban's ear too much, apparently, or maybe Rick right. Carlisle's ear too much. And it was just very dysfunctional over there. And then on top of it, you have Luca, who clearly wants his dude Mosley to be the coach, I'm guessing. And who's a 22-year-old superstar who has a max contract. He can hold over everybody. And you have to cater to this dude. This is the league that we have now. How do you think it plays out in Dallas? Well, did you see Rick Carlisle today is publicly endorsing Jason Kidd? He's saying Jason Kidd should be the head coach, and I'm the only person on the planet that's coached both Jason Kidd and Luka Doncic, and I think they're a perfect match for one another. So he endorsed him over Mosley. Isn't that weird? Ooh, Mosley was his lead assistant. That's tough. Yeah, so what does that mean? Does he think Mosley... That that speaks to the dysfunction, I would say. Yeah, I would say too. So I thought that was very surprising. Didn't Kidd have a bad departure in Dallas, though? I thought he did. I, I, thought, I think, has, hasn't he had a bad departure yeah, everywhere? He's, he's Mr. Bad Departure. Yeah, come on, man. Like I, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and you know, Cuban might be one of the few owners I can think of that if you hire someone that pleaded guilty to assaulting your wife, right? He pleaded guilty, did he not? He did. He did. You, I guess Cuban doesn't care. I care. I care. <laughs> they, they had some issues with that too in the past. So that would be an interesting hire. Yeah. To say the least. So, but, yeah, but who knows? Carlisle, Carlisle came out really strongly just a little while ago with that. So I don't know what that means. I do not know what that means. But you're right. Luka Doncic has got all the keys. He's got the keys to the beach house, the caddy, the Maserati, you know, <laughs> the summer cottage. He's, he's, he's holding everything. 